admit there has been times when I've wondered uh, how God chooses. And he does talk about he chose the nation of Israel and they were chosen for a reason. And um, within that nation, there is a remnant. And then that remnant is a body of believers. And there's some things that God puts in his word that if we look at it real close, we'll see something that's very interesting. We just had our confession of faith that we sung. And you'll notice in verse 26 of chapter 4, where it says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. See that statement? We read that every Sunday morning. But look down in verse 29. For if ye be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So, Galatians chapter 3. Well, I thought you had it committed to memory. All right. Verse 26 of chapter 3. For you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Right? We read that every Sunday morning. Verse 29. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed. So that means all of us are Jewish now. Now I'll have to admit, now that kind of bothered me for a little while. And I didn't always understand how that we are, you know, blessed by Father Abraham. And then I had a problem with the book of Malachi where he makes a statement, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Now wait a minute. That just hit me wrong. God, you didn't really mean that. You couldn't have meant that. Because we know God so loved the world except Esau. Because he says he hated Esau. Now, have you ever heard of that before? You ever heard that God says, I love Jacob, but I hate Esau? How would you like it to have been your name? I love everybody. Except Peter Romano. He said, well, that doesn't bother me none. Yeah, but your name ain't Peter Romano. What if it was Peter Romano? But now, I believe there is a solution to this problem. Now, in the book of Galatians chapter 4, where y'all were a while ago, I don't know why. Galatians chapter 4, there are types in the Old Testament. And many of these we've covered. I will be covering one tonight. The one tonight is a very good sermon. If you can't make it, you know, but only one of these, tonight or this morning, make sure you miss this morning. Galatians and chapter 4. Look what it says in verse 19. My little children. So he's addressing them as believers of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Now the law and putting yourself under the law cannot conform you to Christ. Because Christ is not under the law, neither is the new birth under the law. So the new birth which is your new birth in Christ, cannot grow to maturity. It cannot learn the things that God wants it to learn by placing it under the law. By placing it under the law, you must do, but you place it under Christ, which is the law of love, I want to. It's a total difference. So your Christian life is either law or love. Which one motivates you to do what you do? Well, I have to go to church. I want to go. You say the first one. <laughs> I give because I have to. I want to. So you see, there is a great difference. And your motive is revealing. It will manifest itself in why you do what you do. So, yes, I believe it's important that we learn why do I live and how do I live? Do I live law or do I live grace? Law or love? 
which one is the motivating factor in my life. Now, look what he says there in verse 20. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. Doubt that they're growing and maturing in the Lord. Not, I don't think he's doubting their salvation, but doubting they're maturing in the Lord because you can't mature. You cannot. And if you'll look there in chapter 5 and verse 16, chapter 5, verse 16, where he makes this statement. I believe Christ is formed in you as you walk in the Spirit. See there in verse 16, this I see then walk in the Spirit because that's the only way for Christ to be formed in you. You cannot conform to the image of Christ in your life walking in the flesh. The flesh is under the law, but the Spirit is not under the law. That's why in verse 23, it says there is no law. Those who walk in the Spirit. Meaning you're walking by the law of love. Therefore, love has its own set of rules and boundaries. Because you seek to please the Lord, it tells you what you can and cannot do. But you do it because you love. If you do it because of law, because you have to, then you don't have the joy that you ought to have in the Christian life. Can it affect your whole Christian life? It most certainly can. Now, here in the book of Galatians, you'll notice there in verse 22. For, at chapter 4, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael and Isaac. One by a bond made, and the other by a free woman. So one was a slave and one was free. He uses this as an allegory. It's a story that illustrates a great biblical truth. And you can go back to the Old Testament and find many of these stories that help us to understand. Now, it's important because like, for example, in verse 26, but Jerusalem, which is above, is free. When you were born into this world, you were like a child of Hagar from Mount Sinai when you were born into this world. So you were like a slave of sin under the law. And you did not have any right to be an heir of God. You were not the children of God. But when you were born into God's family, and that's why he says in verse 26, which is above, that's the birth from above. When you are born from above as a child of God, you are free from the flesh. It's a totally different birth altogether. So yes, I was born into this world 73 years ago. So I was a child of the flesh as in bondage under the law. I trusted Christ as my Savior. And I was born from above in the Spirit. Under Christ. Two different births. Now we often go through this and explain this. But the two natures is the greatest teaching on the Christian life I think you'll ever understand. And it'll explain more scriptures. And this is why it's important. Now, look, look, verse 28. Now, we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the what? Children. Children of promise. Isaac was promised to Abraham as a miracle child. As a child born by faith. Abraham had a son when he was an old man. It took God's intervention. It was impossible for Abraham and Sarah to have a child. But God. God made it possible. Isaac was a child that God had promised by faith would come. So that's the new birth. So God made promises and God keeps promises. So whenever you and I trust Christ as our Savior, our new birth, as it says about Isaac, was totally separate from the flesh birth. So I was born into the world, child of the flesh, bondage, enslaved like Hagar. And therefore I'm under the law, condemned. When I trusted Christ as my Savior, born from above. And therefore, I'm a free man. Free 
from the condemnations of the law because the law can't touch me because this one can't sin. This one is born of God. Now, you don't take this new birth and get him to conform to the image of Christ by putting him in the flesh and thinking that that's how it's going to work. It will not work that way. So the Christian is to live by love, not by law. So the question comes down. And Christ mentions it quite a bit. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Remember when Peter, three times, what did he say to him? Do you love me? He never asked him if he loved the sheep. Do you love me? Do you love me? So I believe that is part of our solution to a, a problem. Now, here in verse 31, he says, So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. So I didn't make up this illustration. It's right there in the book. We are children of the free. Therefore, in verse 1 of chapter 5, where he says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty, in the new birth, with the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, some of these things are very clear, very simple, but some things get a little complicated. Some things are a little bit difficult to explain. And sometimes I struggle trying to make sure that, do you really understand what I'm saying? And then I have to ask myself, do I really understand what I'm saying? Have you ever tried to teach something you confused as can be? So take your Bible and turn to the book of Malachi. The book of Malachi. The book of Malachi. Some of y'all will never get that. You're just... In the book of Malachi. Page 980 in a... Church Bible, or if you have an old school for reference Bible, like mine, you'll notice in the book of Malachi in chapter 1, verse 1, the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? So Israel will know, well, how, how do you love me? How do we know you loved us? Well, God says, I, I proved it to you. But he says this, I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau. Lay his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau. Isn't that a terrible thing to put in the Bible? How would you like to be Esau? Well, I'll have to admit, you know, years ago, that, that that really bothered me. But I also got to understand, there's a reason why God says certain things in certain places. Now, God never told Esau when he was alive, I hate you. This is written years and years later, and there, he's not even talking about Jacob, who really lived at that back then. He's talking, there are examples that he's using. And is explaining why he's doing what he's doing. Why he's blessed Israel or he's chastened Israel and the Edomites and so forth. All these things are important to, to realize. Now take your Bible and turn to the book of Romans and look in chapter 1. The book of Romans and chapter 1. I will do everything in my power to confuse you this morning. <laughs> Romans chapter 1, verse 16, verse 16, Jews are Jews, but they still need the gospel. Well, wait a minute, if God's already chosen the Jewish people, and those are the chosen of Israel, the chosen people of God, the children of God, then they're all saved. Wouldn't they, aren't, aren't the Jewish people, uh, those are the children of God. You ever heard that? Chosen by God. Those are the children of God. So they're all saved. So all Jews are going to heaven automatically, right? Yeah, well, look what he says in verse 16. For I am not ashamed 
of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Greeks, because the Jews are already saved. No, to the Jew first. Salvation is of the Jew. But then that means that the Jew, does he have to believe on Christ just like a Gentile would? Yes. Oh, you think so? Okay. Look in Romans in chapter 2. Romans in chapter 2. Now look in verse 17. <clears throat> Behold, thou art called a Jew. Resteth in the law. Makest thy boast of God. Look who you are. You're somebody. You're a Jew. But just because they were a Jew called a Jew, how do you separate this from the fact that not all Jews were children of God? Not all believed in the Lord. And so why does God hate one and love another? Well, he makes a statement down here in verse 28. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. So you can be a Jew inwardly and not be a Jew outwardly. Wouldn't that confuse you just a tad? Oh, here's a Jew, but you're not a Jew. But you're a Jew if you're Jew inwardly, but you're not a Jew if you're Jew outwardly. Duh. Nothing like... Clarity of mind. Simplicity of the scriptures. Well, when I read this, sometimes I get a little on the confused side, so i got to go hunting. I know that it's somewhere in the Bible it will explain all of this for me. Right? You believe that? You believe the Bible teaches itself? Sooner or later it'll all come out in the wash? Well, in verse 29, But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart. In the spirit and not in the letter, whom, whose praise is not of men but of God. Now here you are, you're over in Rome, and Paul writes this letter, and you read that, and you say, What did he say? What's he talking about? Do you understand what he's saying? Now you can make believe that you really understand it, but it is on a little on the controversial side. So who is a, a real Jew? I mean, we look over there at uh, Jay. Jay, there's a Jew. There's a Jew. His name, he told me, was called Jonah. We got a Jonah on board. We got a Jew. But now, he's a saved Jew. Now, believe this. There is the nation of Israel, all born from the seed of Abraham. But there is a remnant of Jewish believers. And I believe that from Abraham all the way down to this present time, nation, no nation, but there's always been a remnant of believing Jews. And I believe there has to be. It cannot be broken. Even though the Jewish people, they've tried over and over again to annihilate the Jew. And they're still talking about wanting to do that today, in our lifetime. But I don't believe that you'll ever annihilate all the Jews. And among those Jews that are a remnant, I believe there is a, a remnant of believing Jews. Those, in God's eyes, are the seed that he says are counted for the promise. So, though there's a lot of Jewish people, there is a seed that he's talking about, and I want to show you that in just a moment. So you look in chapter 3 and verse 1. What advantage then hath the Jew? Well, he had the, the oracles of God. He had the word of God. So he had an advantage of knowing truth. God revealed things to them. And yet they did not believe him. So because they did not believe, then there were some consequences to all of these decisions that they made. Now, take your Bible and turn to the book of Romans in chapter 9. Romans in chapter 9. <clears throat> we know that the Apostle Paul was greatly, greatly concerned for the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, whom he identified with, the various 12 tribes. He says, I'm a 
Pharisee. I'm a Jew, he says, of the tribe of Benjamin. So he knew who he was. He knew where he was from. But there was many people in Israel that never trusted the Lord. But there was a remnant that did trust the Lord. But now notice what he says here in uh, verse 6. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. See? I didn't make it up. It's right there in the book. Though they're in Israel, they're all of Israel, but they're not all Israel. So that, that, that makes sense. And then he explains what he means. In verse 7, Neither because they are the seed of Abraham, the flesh, are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. In other words, what was Isaac? Isaac was of his dad, the flesh. It was his son. But Isaac represents a first birth. I mean a second birth. The new birth. The spirit. Ishmael represents the flesh. He was first and then Isaac. Both born, same dad. Flesh first, then spirit. The one that was by promise was Isaac. Now, those that are born like Isaac are counted for the seed. Those are those that are born by faith. And the flesh represented by Ishmael are those that are children of the flesh. And God says, those that are of Abraham, though they are flesh, those are not the ones counted for the promise. The only ones who are going to have heaven and have eternal life are those that are like Isaac, children that are born by faith in Jesus Christ. So look what else he says. In verse 7, Remember, the remnant is the seed of the new birth. There's a remnant of a believing body of individuals who believe on the Messiah. All the way from Abraham, all the way down through time, there has to always be these two seeds. The flesh, the spirit. The flesh, the spirit. All the way down through time. Flesh, spirit. So even today, we still have... Flesh, spirit. Now, this is important for the understanding of what's going on in your own life. Because, see, they are a visible picture of important scriptural doctrine about the two natures. When you were born into this world, which came first, the flesh or the spirit? Your flesh birth came first. Your flesh birth was under the law and condemned. That's why you needed to be born from above. So when you trusted Christ as your Savior, you got a new birth. One that's only by faith. Because you believe the promise of God. So God made a promise to Abraham in the Old Testament. And I want you to hold your place here and because we'll come back. But look in the book of Galatians in chapter 3. Galatians in chapter 3. And look there in verse 6. Galatians chapter 3, verse 6. It's on page 1243. But in verse 6 says, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. When Abraham took God at his word, God gave Abraham his Righteousness. So Abraham had imputed righteousness. Abraham was justified before God, declared righteous before he was ever circumcised, before the law was ever given. So whenever these legalistic Judaizers came along and says you must keep the law of Moses and be circumcised, they were wrong. Because Abraham lived before the law, before he was circumcised, he was justified by faith alone. 
So the message they were preaching was wrong, and they had to have a Jerusalem council of the apostles come together, whereby they declared that those who are teaching this are teaching in error. We gave no such commandment, and therefore nobody today, any preacher anywhere, has a right to tell people they have to earn their way to heaven by their works. That's the flesh. That's the law. A man is saved by grace. The new birth is only by faith in Christ alone. When you see it, it's clear as a bell. It's beautiful. But notice what he says now in verse 7. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, not works, faith, the same are the what? Children of Abraham. I am a child of Abraham, only by my faith in Christ. Jesus says that this seed is a reference to him. Abraham was saved by putting his faith in Christ. I am saved by putting my faith in Christ. And his body, Abraham, too old to have children, but a miracle child wrought by God himself, Isaac was born. Our flesh cannot produce the new birth. Abraham and Sarah could not produce this child. But God intervened. And with man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So the new birth has to be a miracle birth. A birth by faith alone. And that's where Isaac was born. So when we are born by faith, we're believing just like Abraham did. And we get a new birth. It's not Ishmael. It is Isaac. They represent the old and the new. The old birth, the old man, the old nature, but the new birth, the new birth, the new nature. Separate. Two different things. Two different sons. And it's even mentioned in the book of Galatians for this reason. To help us understand. Now notice what it says in verse 8. For the scripture, the Old Testament, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. So the law was given to show a man cannot save himself. Because verse 10 says, For as many as are of the works of the law are not under the blessing but under a curse. For they must continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But no man can keep the law. That's why the law can only condemn. The law cannot excuse. The law cannot pardon. The law cannot justify. No man is justified by the law in the sight of God. So a man can't be saved by his works. And you'd be surprised how many people are going to church today trying to earn their way to heaven. If they only understood these stories in the Old Testament were stories, yes, that we teach them to our children, but they have a doctrinal meaning to them. There's a reason why God put them into his word. Now, Go back to the Romans in chapter 9. So now when he makes this statement in verse 8, that is they which are the children of the flesh, in reality, yes, it's talking about the nation of Israel here, and that the children of Israel, just because they were born as a Jew, and God had blessed them as a nation, because they were responsibilities as a nation they were supposed to fulfill, doesn't make them a child of God. They were chosen to serve as a nation because God wanted to use them as a light to the world. And they blew it. Now, it says, These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise. Those that believe the promise are counted for the seed. You see, it's not just those who are born into the nation of Israel, but it's those who are Believers of the nation of Israel. It's the new birth. And he says, for this is the word of promise. 
at this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also hath conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, and then if uh, you just kind of forget verse 11 for a second and just go right down there to verse 12, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. Now right, look up here. Which birth came first? The flesh. Which one came second? The new birth. Who is supposed to serve who? The first birth is supposed to serve the second birth. Not the second birth served the first birth. You have a flesh birth and a spirit birth. When you read once again there in the book of Galatians in chapter 5 and verse 16, walk in the spirit and will not fulfill the... So who should be in subservient to the first birth, I mean the second birth? You see, the flesh is supposed to submit to the first birth. We have one body, two births, two natures. And it is the new birth that is supposed to dominate your life. Don't let sin have dominion over you. Don't let that flesh birth of yours have the control of your life. Once you see it, you can, it, it, it's clear. And if you're still muddy, ain't no thing I can do about it. But go back here to Romans in chapter 9 where it says, Now in verse 13, as it is written, Jacob have I loved. Jacob represents the second birth. And Esau represents the first birth. Which was born first, Esau or Jacob? Now, this is a difficult question. <laughs> Who? Esau was born first. He represents the flesh birth. Jacob, and he was a conniver. I mean, he was a pretty bad fellow himself. But he was born second. But he believed God. And the first birth, he despised his birthright, what he had as our birthright. So God made a decision long before. You see, God hates the flesh birth. He don't hate the person. He hates that flesh sinful nature that we have. That's why God did something about it. He gave us the new birth when we trust Christ as our Savior. So if you look there in verse 11. For the children being not yet born having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. God had already decided those who believe have his blessings, and those who do not believe do not have his blessings. This is why when Jacob was dying, remember he had already sold his birthright. And the Bible says in Hebrews in chapter 11 that he sought repentance with tears when he should have inherited the blessing he was rejected. And he would have. But those were choices. But that was a, as a son of the father that would have inherited the physical blessings that he had. But not the spiritual. Jacob believed in the Lord. As wicked as he was, he still believed in the Lord. We don't find those things about Esau. But they represent the flesh and the spirit. And tonight I'm going to tie some of this up a little bit differently. With a person called Amalek. But I'll explain that later tonight. But God made up his mind before the children were ever born. Did any good or bad? Had nothing to do with that is that God already decided I'm going to bless the believers and chasten the unbelievers. He hates that sinful nature. You see, you got in a sinful nature, right? God hates that sinful nature. But He loves your new one. He wants you to walk with Him. But He knows the struggle that you go for. That's why Galatians in chapter 5 is explaining the battle that you have to go through. Because you have within you the desire, you want to walk in the flesh, <laughs> and you want to walk in the Spirit. Now, 
Take your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. It's the last book in the Bible if you turn it upside down. <laughs> Genesis chapter 15. We, we read this verse just a moment ago in Galatians in chapter 3. See, I'm going all over the place too, but that's what Paul did when he wrote the book of Galatians. He went everywhere. That's what you find in the book of Romans. They go back to the Old Testament and they quote these scriptures and boom, there they are. All I'm doing is going to the same verses they talked about. So in Galatians, I mean in Genesis in chapter 15, look in verse 6. So he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Faith alone. Now has, did Abraham have to keep the law? No, the law wasn't given for 430 years later. So there's no way of saying that Abraham could be saved because he didn't keep the law. It wasn't over him. He was saved before then. So also look in chapter 17. Chapter 17. And look in verse 24. Verse 24. And Abraham was 90 years old and nine. Now, when he was saved, he was about 75. Now you're talking about he's 99 years old. He's almost 100 years old. When he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. He said, what's this got to do with anything? I'll show you. He was 99 years old when he was circumcised. And there, there 25. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. So we know that Abraham has already been justified by faith. 14 years or so, or 24 years before he was ever circumcised. So whenever the Jewish legalizers coming down from Jerusalem to Galatia teaching them that you have to keep the law. What? Because Abraham did. you got to be circumcised like Abraham was. Wait a minute. When was Abraham justified? When was he saved? Before the law and before he was circumcised. So it had nothing to do with the salvation. It didn't save him. He was already saved. And that's verified in the book of Galatians in chapter 3 and verse 8. What we just read. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before unto Abraham the gospel, saying, In thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And in verse 6, Abraham believed God, he was counted in him for righteousness. So we have verification. That's all he did to receive the righteousness of God. Now, look there in the book of uh, Genesis in chapter 21. Genesis 21. And look at verse 5. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. He was a hundred years old when Isaac was born. A look down in verse 12. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman and all that Sarah had said unto thee. Hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And who was born from Isaac? Jacob came along. But Jacob and Esau. But Esau was born first, representing flesh, the other spirit. When you talk about Saul in the Bible, who was the first king, and who was the second king? David. You have like an example of flesh, spirit. When you talk about in the Bible, two were born. Cain, Abel. Cain, flesh, Abel, spirit. There is examples that are used throughout scriptures that God says he's teaching something by the very lives of the people themselves. Now, take your Bible and turn all the way over there to the book of Romans in chapter 4. Romans 
chapter 4. In seeking to explain about Abraham and how he is such an answer to a lot of questions and problems. Because you have a lot of people trying to make the Bible say something that the Bible does not say. I get ridiculed all the time because of this so-called easy believism. If it's so easy, why don't everybody believe it? But it's by grace and grace alone. People cannot believe. It's so difficult for them to understand that yes, you can trust Christ as your Savior and never serve God and go to heaven. They just can't believe that can't be true. But it is true. It is true. These are two different births. This one cannot annul that one. And so once you've trusted Christ as Savior, you are a child of God by faith and faith alone. That's why it says you are the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. That's why he says you are the children of Abraham. Because you're saved the same way Abraham because of the seed. Christ came from that line. And we are simply on down the line. Believing the same thing that he believed. Now here in Romans in chapter 4. You'll notice in verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father hath pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof the glory, but not before God. If Abraham were justified by his works, he could brag about it. He could boast about it. And then if he did earn his salvation by his works, then God would be in debt to him. That's why he says there in the next verse 4. Verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of what? Debt. Then salvation would not be free, it would be by your works, and God would be in debt. You would have it come into you because you earned it. Look what I did. And there's people who say, well, I go to church. I give money. I try to do the best I can. I'm living as good as I can. What are they referred to? What they're doing. If they can't say, I'm going to heaven because of what Christ did for me, instead of what I'm doing for him, they don't get it. You're saved by grace and grace alone. Heaven and hell is the issue. And the Bible says many people are going to be confused. Many people are going to try to earn their way to heaven. They will not see that it is totally by grace. That it's totally by, it is free. So he uses this illustration here. Then he makes a statement down here in verse 6. He refers to David. David also described the blessedness of the man under whom God imputed righteousness without what? Without works. In verse 8, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sins. In other words, I sinned after I was saved, but they're not put to my account. They're put to his. I got a payment. I got like a counter escrow. So the question comes up with him. That means you can just go ahead and live like you please. Commit all kinds of sins. I don't know. Well, that's not right. I didn't say it was right. Don't we do a lot of things that ain't right? But even though I know that, and I believe that, I still want to serve the Lord with all my heart. I want to do right because I love the Lord. If I did because I had to, I'd be living under the law. I don't have to go to church, and I don't have to read my Bible. It will not annul the promise that God gave. But I do it because I do love Him. And I want to do it. Love is so much more powerful than law. Law can only condemn because you never live up to this high standard you set for yourself. But if you'll live by grace, love will make you do things the law doesn't even talk about. Now look what he says. Down in verse 9. Come of this blessedness, then upon the circumcision only, the Jewish people, or upon the uncircumcision, Gentiles. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. That's what we say. Well, that's what God said. Verse 11, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had not yet, had yet been uncircumcised. When did Abraham become justified, saved, received the righteousness of God? Before he was circumcised. So he was uncircumcised. 
And then he became circumcised years later. So therefore, he did not become circumcised in order to be saved. But the Bible says being circumcised was a sign of the seal he had already received. In other words, this is a done deal. And Abraham believed on the Lord. Once you trust Christ as Savior and he gives you his righteousness, there is no verse where God ever takes it away. So years later, he was circumcised, which is a cutting away of the filth of the flesh, which he's talking about the separation of the old birth from the new birth, from the flesh to the spirit of what he believed. It was a sign of the seal of the righteousness God had already given to him. So being circumcised didn't save him, but it was a picture of a new birth. That he believed what God said. And then, lo and behold, Isaac is born. And Isaac is this new birth. Because he was born right after he was circumcised. Now, I believe there's a story there. I believe there's a reason why God does everything that he does. So he says this in the last part of verse 11, that he might be the father of all them that, what's that word? Believe. believe. Look up there in verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth his, the ungodly, his faith is counted for what? Righteousness. Righteousness. So if that was true with Abraham, God says he's going to save everybody the same way. He made a promise that the heathen would be justified by faith alone. And Abraham's life and the child and all the things and Jacob and Esau, they're all pictures of the whole Christian life, the spiritual life, the battle between the two natures. It's all there. God had told them, and I believe that it was the will of God for every father who had that son circumcised on the eighth day, that child was supposed to have been taught and educated to understand this has to do with Abraham's faith in the Lord. That's what it was about. That was a sign of the seal Abraham already had. Now see, you and I today, when we trust Christ as our Savior, He says, that very moment you trust the Lord, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. It was a promise that God made. And once circumcised, always circumcised. And once you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit, you're sealed. You have eternal life. You're going to heaven when you die. The best news in all the world. Anyway, there's a lot more. But let me just give you a couple more verses here. Look there in verse 13. For the promise, see that word promise? For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. What God promised was that there is a remnant among all the Jewish people the Israelites or the Jews, there is a remnant of believing. Just like there's, there's always this remnant. I would say that even everybody that's in this room, though all of us are in this room, we may not all be believers. But I believe there's a remnant of believers in the body of Christ. That is a remnant from out of the world. God knows those who have believed in Him. We have this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His. So if you have trusted Christ as your Savior, you have eternal life. If you have not trusted Christ as your Savior, <coughs> it doesn't matter who you are. Jew or Gentile, there's loss of a hound dog in the end of a soup bone. You ain't going. You can only go to heaven. And God says before you were ever born, before you did any good or any evil, the decision is made. God is going to save all of those who put their faith in Jesus Christ. And if you do not, you do not go to heaven. And you do not go past go and collect $200. <laughs> Look up here. This hand represents you and me. This wallet represents sin. We all sin. 
This is our first birth, born with a sinful nature, and we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because of sin, we have to pay for it. And the wages of sin is death, eternal separation from the Lord. We were children of bondage, bound by our old sinful nature. We could not conquer our old sinful nature. We could not live a perfect life, even though we want to and we would love to. We don't love God the way we should. We don't love each other the way we should. We don't even love ourselves the way we should. We don't know real true love. We fail. We hurt each other. We wrong each other. We do all kinds of things and wish we'd never done it. We have regret and sorrow and shame and all that. God says that's because you've got this old sinful nature. But to go to heaven, you have to be perfect and righteous as God. That means this birth can't go. <coughs> So God says, got good news for you. Now, because you can't change yourself, you can't, you can't do anything about it. You're in bondage. You're condemned already. This hand represents Jesus Christ of the seed of Abraham. Came into this world because he loves us, but he hates our sin. He hates that sinful nature. So as the illustration, I hate Esau. But the Bible says Jesus Christ, who had no sin, never did anything wrong, came into the world because he loved us, took all the sin, paid for it on the cross, and came back from the dead. And he says that whosoever would believe this would be born again, born without this sinful nature. We would be born because we believe the promise. God would make us pure and holy and separated. Your new birth is born of God, born of God. God has no sin to pass on to it, to that new child. And no sin, no death. Once you're a child of God, you're his child forever. And he'll never cast you out and never lose you. That's how we know we're going to heaven. So this is a spirit birth, born by faith. This is the flesh birth under the law. This one is under love. I love him because look what he did for me. He set me free from the law of sin and death. He set me free. I don't have to worry about the grave. This one is going to die, but this one will never die. My new birth, born of God, I'm going to heaven when I die. Therefore, we are all, those who believe, are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Therefore, we all are children of Abraham by faith in Christ Jesus. Let's pray, shall we? With every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, would you trust Him? Do you understand? You cannot save yourself. You have been born into this world with a flesh birth. You have to have a second birth to go to heaven. And that's only by faith in Christ will you trust Him. Would you put your confidence in Jesus Christ and what He did for you? What did He do for you? He went to the cross and paid for your sins. He paid for your sins to set you free. And only by accepting that payment because you didn't have what it takes to pay. You'd be eternally separated from God. But he made a payment for you. Would you believe that he did it for you? That he loved you that much? And if you will trust him right now as your Savior, he'll give you as a free gift everlasting life. And you can know that you're going to heaven whenever you die. And if you're making that decision, I'd like to know. Would you just slip your hand up very quickly and put it right back down? I'm not going to have you forward. I'm not going to embarrass you. But right where you're sitting. Say, preacher, that made sense to me. And I want to know for sure that I'm going to heaven. Now I'll trust Christ right now as my Savior. If you will, I'd like to have prayer for you in closing. Anyone at all? Anyone at all? If you're watching by internet, the same thing goes for you. Right there on the screen. Say, yes, I'll trust Christ as my Savior. I pray that you will. We'd love to know. Our Father, we thank you again for your blessings. Thank you for all you've done for us. Thank you for the study of your word. Bless each one for being here and those that are watching by internet. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.